I really love having a podcast. I get to talk to amazing people doing amazing things in real estate. This episode is with Rasul Mutawakil. Rasul is an army veteran and educates people on getting into real estate. Rasul is the director of operations with Disrupt Equity and has been on a complete mission to grow his multifamily portfolio. Uh, Rasul is always looking for properties uh, for him and his team so he can work with passive investors to be a part of these uh, amazing opportunities. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. You're going to learn a ton from Rasul and what he has to say. Um, thank you for checking it out. Welcome to Passive Investor's Playbook. I'm your host, Charlie Hardage. In each episode, we'll sit down with successful people that turn to real estate to build and grow their wealth. We do a deep dive into why they chose real estate and what makes it so attractive to them. We explore why people in their industry could also benefit from passively investing in real estate. Whether you're a beginner or an experienced investor, a doctor or a professional athlete, love your job or hate your job, our show is here to help you build a profitable real estate portfolio while maximizing your free time and minimizing stress. So sit back, relax, and get ready to learn from some of the best in the business. Welcome to Passive Investor's Playbook. Thank you so much for tuning in today to Passive Investor's Playbook. My name is Charlie Hardage. And I am joined by a Army veteran, Rasul Mutawakil. Uh, Rasul specializes in financial analysis and underwriting to determine an investment's potential. As a U.S. Army veteran, intelligence operative, his attention to detail, work ethic, and desire to serve others with pertinent information are his primary drivers. Rasul has a bachelor's degree in computer programming and is certified with numerous financial licenses in the state of Florida. He was an owner operator of a multiple six figure Airbnb business in Miami and currently has grown his multifamily investment portfolio by over $100 million in the past year. Pretty insane. As a husband, father, and ambitious entrepreneur, Rasul's long term goals include establishing generational wealth for his family, as well as the continuous development of his education platform to show others how they too can reach any financial goal faster than they ever thought possible. Rasul, I, I love that intro. I did not write that. Uh, I, I love the intro. Uh, man, I'm, I'm super excited to have you today. Thanks for being here. Awesome. Hey, thanks so much for having me, Charlie, man. It's a pleasure to be here. Awesome. Um, we're, we were talking a little bit uh, before the call about the military and, and your time there. Um, you, uh, I don't know if you still speak Korean, but but you're a Korean um, intelligence agent or... Yeah, I was, I was a cryptologic linguist. So basically, uh, me and my whole uh, company, we would spy on North Korea. We were stationed in South Korea, and we had planes that fly along the DMZ intercepting uh, enemy radio communication. And uh, yeah, I would translate it into Korean and then crypto uh, encrypt it into our code, which I'm sure has changed by now. I've been out for like almost 20 years. Oh, my God. I've been out for almost 20 years. <laughs> um and uh, not to date myself here, yeah. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, and then I just send those reports up. I loved it. I was speaking Korean all the time. Right now, uh, since there's not a lot of people I speak to uh, speak Korean with, I lost most of it. But I'm pretty dangerous in a restaurant. So man, that's awesome. Um, maybe you understood a lot more in Squid Game than most of us, right? I don't know if you saw it, but uh... I did. I was <laughs> yeah. telling my wife I was correcting some of the subtitles. Yeah, that's not what they really said. That's hilarious, man. That that that's so cool. Um, I didn't learn a language in in the military, but um, wish, wish I did. I, I know some of the the soldiers in my squad and and company were able to go to language school, and it's like a super quick trial by fire, you know. Um, but you actually got a lot more training than most people. Yeah. And uh, man, that that's so cool. Jealous there, but um, <laughs> well, hey, man, thank you so much for being here. I uh, let's talk about real estate as much as I love the the military, the army, and. Uh, learning languages. Um, that's not why I wanted you on today, but um, just perks, right? For sure. um, man, so, I, you know, you're in, uh, did I read that right? That you have, um, 
let's see, your multifamily investment portfolio. In the last 12 months, you've grown that by over $100 million just in the last 12 months? That's an old bio. Um, I, I'm probably north of half a billion now. Holy cow. Uh, with assets under management as a general partner in okay. multiple syndications. And yeah, I've I've done a few different partnerships with a few different groups. Currently, my my main go-to squad is Disrupt Equity. I'm the director of acquisitions there. And I basically vet all of the deals that come through. I run the numbers, the analysis, and determine whether or not we actually want to go ahead and submit an offer on that deal. And, and we focus on institutional size deals, 30 to 70 million is our sweet spot. Wow. And, and um, I, obviously this is going to vary, but how many units would that be, Rasul, like at, at each property? Uh, average right now is probably a, a 175-ish or so. I've got 3,311 total units. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, 175 is your is uh, probably the average unit count. Um, you know, it's funny because... Someone, someone might hear 175 units or, um, heck, even 40 units, right? And think, yeah. oh, yeah, that's great for Rasul, but I could never do that. And that that's exactly what I thought, you know, um, several years ago. And what, what's really cool about uh, the bigger, the better, in my opinion, you, you know, the bigger, the better, it's it's not that much more work to double the the uh, property size, right? It's not double the work, um, and and I think you know the, the syndication space. Uh, there's a lot of different jobs and, and things you can do in that. I know you underwrite the deals and and do some financial modeling. That's what mm -hmm. I do as well. I love that. So you get to do deep dives in numbers and uh, you know hang out with spreadsheets all day and and really analyze deals. Um, it, I guess that would kind of go to your computer um, uh, science background. Yeah, actually. So having a background in video game programming makes looking at data and information <laughs> a lot easier um, because I, I had to get really good at linear algebra, calculus, uh, applied physics, literally for like, like actually just conceptualizing how uh, projectiles would fly through the air and doing the math and showing how that would be if it collided with something else and how the trajectory would change, like all that type of high level math. When I start looking at financial models, it's like, ah, oh, okay, I'm back in elementary school again. <laughs> that's how that's how it feels for me. Yeah, um, wait, that's awesome. Uh, but yeah, and I, I I love the acquisition side because uh, it gives me a good you know sense of peace of mind of knowing that I'm going after something pretty conservatively, and at the same time, I also do investor relations because I raise capital for. Uh, all of the deals that I'm a part of. And I love being able to have conversations with investors. Like you said, in the very beginning, before I, I even knew about apartment investing and syndications and what any of this stuff was, I, I literally just thought it was like uh, Wall Street hedge funds, yeah. like super rich people who are buying these things. I, I didn't realize that through syndications, everyday investors like you and I, I was a federal employee, right? I, I just, you know, on the GS scale, I made, you know, decent income, but I wasn't like wealthy by any means. And once I learned that you can do it through partnerships, it really just opened the floodgates to what has been possible and what I'm able to do. And I don't know if you talk about this at all, but I, I only started in apartment investing in 2020. Yeah. Wow. That's, when, that's when I got into syndications. Man. So three years later, here we are with uh, almost a half a B as in Bravo, half a <laughs> billion dollars of assets under management. Yeah. Almost three years in October to be a <laughs> three years. Oh, thanks for rubbing that in. Um, <laughs> <laughs> man, that, that, that's amazing. And I love what you said, Rasul, about the Wall Street hedge funds and huge in, uh, institutions. And, you know, it, it's funny because that that was me, right? You, you know, driving by these gorgeous apartment complexes, like, oh man, someone's someone's doing really well if they can afford that. It's probably not a person though, right? It's probably large insurance companies and pension funds, and you know, these yeah. just guys that uh, drive million dollar cars, you know, and and um, but that's not like a normal person. So you got to get a job, you got to you know go that route, four hundred one k, all that stuff. And, you know, you were the same way initially and now through um, many partnerships and, and at Disrupt e uh, Equity, you guys are killing it, obviously. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and you guys are just normal people, right? Which is what I love. Um, yeah. Yeah. The, the owners of the company um, uh, is actually, I'm, I'm noticing a, a trend here. The owners of uh, Disrupt Equity, uh, Ben Suttles and Ferris Musa, both have IT backgrounds. Uh, Ferris used to be a programmer for Microsoft and I, uh, Ben did IT sales. 
Um, so maybe there's some some correlation of being able to understand the numbers uh, behind the business of multifamily and working in information technology. But uh, definitely, it's it's really just purely come down to like mathematical analysis, making data driven decisions instead of, um, you know, a lot of people want to get into real estate because they're like, oh, yeah, real estate's a bulletproof investment. You just buy it and you're going to make money at, you know, truth be told, that used to work. You know, probably for the past 12, 13 years or so, we've been on a crazy bull run in the real estate market in this country. And anybody could have bought anything at broker pro forma and they would have made money for the most part, probably 80, 90 percent chance of success. Yeah. Now, with the way that the market has been changing since last year, with interest rates going up the way that they have, it's starting to separate the average guys you know, from the people who really understand how this business works. So as passive investors, you have to scrutinize a lot more and you have to be savvy yourself um as to what investments you want to back and you know which which horse you want to put in the race right yeah. i i love that you mentioned it background uh i'm in uh, I, I was in it sales about uh, 10 12 years i know a lot of the audience's uh former colleagues friends you know and, and family members in it sales and i yep. think that you, you know it's funny uh that that you mentioned that the multifamily side comes down to mathematical decisions it's just numbers yeah and uh, I, i've heard that a few times and it makes me laugh because at, at at first you see that and you're like, yeah, there's so many numbers everywhere. But but when you start learning it, you know um, how to break down deals. And it, even as a passive investor, right, you don't have to be an active full time uh, underwriter like yourself. Right. Um, you just look at the numbers. And and um, I love also what you said, Rasul, about the uh, you know last five years, seven years, whatever. You could buy a deal and and probably nine out of ten times you'd make money, right? Maybe not hit the the projections, but you'd still make money. And I think what separates, um, especially in the last what 15, 16 months, uh, what separates the uh professionals and the people that, that just got into it is let's see how the deal performs now, right? Because interest rates are <laughs> a lot higher than than they were 15, uh, 18 months ago. So oh, yeah. I love that you pointed that out too. Um Man, okay. So I, I got to ask. You were in. Uh, you were in the military. Uh, after the military, you went to school. Um, you, you got a, a bachelor's. How did you get into real estate? That's not a common jump. Yeah. Um, well, I've always known that I wanted to at least in some way, shape, or form be involved in real estate. I actually, when I got out of the military back in '06, I read Rich Dad Poor Dad for the first time. Oh yeah. And, you know, that's like a staple for almost every single real estate investor. The difference, though, from where I grew up in South Florida and for people that are in the neighborhood that I grew up in and people around me, nobody was in real estate. As a matter of fact, I was like the lead horse because I'm the only person who's ever left. If I go back to where my mom and dad live right now, I will see all my same friends from high school living the same life that they were living way back then, 20 years ago. And it's, it's like a time capsule almost. So it's a little bit of a wonder that I even made it out at all. And uh, I definitely attribute, attribute that to the military, just opening my mind and let me see the world for a little bit. But when I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad the first time, I it felt like fiction to me. I was like, oh, this is amazing. People buy property and, and they, you know, they make their millions. Like a lot of the listeners might be like, oh, yeah, if you're going to get into apartment investing, you have to be super rich. And I didn't actually buy my first investment property until about 12 years later, right, in 2018. Oh. Now, the way that I got there was after the military, uh, I actually had a good chunk of change saved up. In hindsight, man, hindsight is 2020. I really wish I can go back and just talk to my younger selves, slap some sense into me, because all I did, you know, you're, most people are a product of their environment. Yeah. And all my friends back then were, you know, just knuckleheads or in our 20s. We just wanted to party, do the stuff that we saw on TV. So all the cash, I had like $40,000 in cash saved up. After five years, you know, and you know, as as Lauren, we didn't we didn't get paid very much. That's like one and a half years of uh, not spending a penny, man. That was over two years. I, my salary at the time was only eighteen k a year. Oh, right. Wow. And so, yeah, thank, thanks, thanks to World of Warcraft. You know, fifteen bucks a month—that was all my entertainment for the whole month, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, I was a big gamer, big nerd. That's why I got my degree in that and everything. And I just, I didn't ever, I never spent any cash. I was re always really good at saving, very terrible at investing. I had no idea what how to. Take care of money. So when I got out of the military, I was hanging out with my friends, literally, Charlie, six days a week. I was partying here in Miami, going to clubs, um, going to different bars. And I mean, I, I even remember spending $750 on a bottle of Grey Goose for this VIP section because it was about the experience 
right? Mm-hmm. And I just let my friends talk me into everything. And um, eventually I went broke after two years of just straight partying. And then and I was like, well, I guess what I'm supposed to do is follow the, tr- the typical advice that you have in this country. Is go get a degree, go get a job, buy a house, meet someone or whatever order it goes in. And then you you go through the gamut, right? So I was like, okay, cool. I spent all of my cash, went from 40000 to zero, maybe down to like five, right? Then I went into debt almost six figures to get my degree yeah. from Full Sail University that I still have never worked for a video game company to this day. Um, right when I graduated, it was around the Great Recession. So mm-hmm. I couldn't even get a job as a programmer. Everybody's getting laid off left and right. So in 2010, I got my first adult job in life insurance sales. And okay. so I did life insurance sales. And and let me tell you, the me on a podcast right now, having a conversation with you or being on stages, teaching people about multifamily investing and all sorts of stuff, never would have happened if I never got that sales job because I was the shyest, most scared kid ever. Like my shadow would jump out from me and I would run inside, yeah. right? And, and just go and play games. That, that was that was me my whole entire life. So when I got into sales, it was secret swim, right? And because I had, you know, my student loans would come out of deferment, my rent was due, I needed cash. So I learned the skill of sales, which is extremely important and valuable, especially in real estate when you're negotiating with these sellers and everything like that. And um, I'm really grateful for the experience, no matter how difficult it was going through it. And uh, I eventually burned out of sales and I got my first corporate job, you know, working a nine to five in Kansas City. A friend of mine from college called me up because we stayed in touch, my best friend, Joel. And he said, hey, man, I've been getting really good at this company. If you want, you say the word, I'll get you in there. So uh, I had an interview over the phone. I was studying my programming because it's been a few years. I was a little bit rusty, but I passed the flying colors and I got hired. And (laughs) there's something about being an entrepreneur on your own, making your own way, and then going into like the cubicle life. And I didn't make it a full year. You know, I, I, I took my wife, uh, she was my girlfriend at the time, we got married, and she, because she wouldn't move across the country with a guy who was just a boyfriend, right? We were already engaged, so. She's, she's smart. Yeah, she's smart. So um, uh, we got married and moved to Kansas City. I'm working for a company called Cerner doing tech support stuff. And I get fired and she is livid. She's like, you dragged me all the way across the country for this. And uh, um, she said, you know what? Apply for the federal government. I was like, that's not a bad idea because I'm a, I'm a disabled veteran. Yeah. I've gotten all these degrees, lots of experience. There's no reason why I shouldn't get hired. So I actually got hired on in HUD, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, in the multifamily division. Whoa. That's, that's where I started in the federal government. That's awesome. And um, I started as an account executive. I took a pay cut. I went from fifty to $47,000. <laughs> My goodness. All right, it's an acquisition period there. Um, and, uh, I remember when I was working in multifamily, I did in what we called an EARL interest rate reduction loan. Uh, basically it's a cash out refi. And I was like, I'm signing this document and somebody out there in the world who owns this property is going to make half a million dollars. Like I'm literally just handing them a check for or like 10 years or plus of my income. And it kind of planted that seed in my mind that there's something different about working this, like, I can't work this job for 30, 40 years and ever hope to get something like that, right? That's never going to come. There's no bonus. My bonus in the in the government was like maybe six or $700 for the whole year. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and uh, luckily uh, they, they kind of upset me. I, I was a rock star in multifamily in Kansas city and um, uh, they passed me up for a promotion because they always talked about hiring from within. And I got, uh, I was the only person interviewing for this position for the promotion out of the peer group that I started with. And they passed me up for somebody in the outside. And then they wanted me to train her. <laughs> and I was like, oh, no. So I literally it, just exhausted my workload. It busted my hump, emptied everything. And then I applied for another job. And that was as a senior financial analyst across the river on the Missouri side, because I was working in KCK, Kansas City, Kansas. So I get over to the financial management center. And when I get that job, the first day I sit in the boss's boss's office and he says, welcome aboard, Rasul. We're super happy to have you. One thing I want you to know about this job, and I don't know why he told me this, but he sat me down and he said, Rasul, you'll never be rich working in this job. And a lot of people make 
a very good life for themselves, but you will be comfortable. And ever since he said that, man, it's like I was already subconsciously just working on an exit plan. Like I had to get out of here. So even though it, it became a six figure job, it was it, it, he, he said all the things that I was going to do. Um, working as a senior financial analyst, analyzing all the finances for uh, public housing authorities in upstate New York. Um, I would do projections for them, budget forecasts and everything like that. And I was like, you know what, what would happen if I analyzed me and my wife as if we were a business? And I looked 30 years into the future about what would look like with standard uh, promotion growth and everything like that. But with even the two of us having six figure nine to five jobs and the rate of inflation, cost of living and everything like that going up, I was like appalled at how bad we would be financially. Yeah, we'd have maybe a couple million bucks in our retirement, but a couple million bucks in the future, 30 years from now, does not amount to what it sounds like today. And even today, a couple million bucks doesn't even really go very far. Right. Right. So that that was the other like nail in the coffin for me. I was like, I talked to my wife, I showed her my findings and she's like, okay, well, we need to figure something out. We need to do something outside of our jobs because we love our jobs. Our jobs are great. They provide great security, but it's not our exit plan. And so I went, I did what anybody who had half a brain would do at that moment. And I think it was this 2017 at the time. I got on the computer, went to Google and said, how do I get rich? <laughs> <laughs> it's literally how it started for me, Charlie. I Googled how to get rich. And I, I read an article that said 95% of millionaires are made in real estate. I was like, cool, cool, cool. How do I do real estate, Mr. Google? And I found a forum called Bigger Pockets, yep. which a lot of people might be familiar with. I learned about house hacking. So when I moved back to Miami with my wife, my three dogs, we bought a duplex, lived in one side and rented the other side out. So my mortgage was 2100 bucks. I'm paying, uh, and the renter was paying $1,900, so it's only costing me $200 a month to live in Miami. And I'm like, they think there's something into this. Then we learned about Airbnb, and then the other side was doing $3,500 a month. And I was like, babe, hear me out. We're going to move back in with my mom and dad in the house that I grew up in, and we're going to do uh, Airbnb on both sides. Charlie, that property was doing $70,000 a year in cash flow. Holy cow. Right. That's, top, that's top line revenue, but still. That's absolutely insane. It paid for that house and it paid for this house that I'm in right now. Wow. Right? If I was flying high, doing everything that I that I want to do, I was kind of swamped with time because it was all, Airbnb is very time uh, time intensive. Time intensive, yes, yeah. thank you. Very time intensive uh, for management because there's guests and also and even with third party property management, it was so much to do. And luckily, my office in Brickell was like ten minutes away from where my rental was. Right. I've already quit my W2, so I can talk about this stuff now. <laughs> um, and I was flying high up until 2020 when the pandemic happened. So I owned that Airbnb. I probably made a couple hundred thousand dollars in cash flow wow. um, off of that deal. Plus buying property in, in Miami and having it appreciate for a couple of years. I made another couple hundred thousand dollars there. So when travel stopped and everything, it was it was a double edged sword for me. Right. Because. The bookings stopped coming in. The, ca the cash slowed down, but I got all my time back. And when I got that time back in 2020, I was like, okay, let me reassess because there has to be a different way to do real estate. Because I know that there's people out there who have like hundreds, if not thousands of doors of real estate, and I'm drowning with two. And I'm a pretty sharp guy. And I'm hardworking. I, there, there's something that I'm missing here. So I went on a search, found a boot camp, and learned about um, commercial multifamily investing. As a matter of fact, I didn't even find it. My friend, who's independently wealthy, called me and said, hey, Rasul, do this with me because it's going to take me from millionaire status to multi-multi-millionaire status and I want you to come with me, All right? I was like, everybody needs a friend like that. I was like, yeah. I'm sold, man, let's go. So I sat there, I devoured all that information. It had my mind blown. It's like at that moment when I learned about how syndications worked and I learned about um, commercial real estate investing, all the work history and everything that I had came to play because my technical analysis from my job, my uh, programming skills and ability to understand spreadsheets and code really well from my education, just working in HUD and multifamily, being on the inside track there, working as a senior, senior financial analyst, like all my skills just click, 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 boom. And then I learned how syndications work. So I signed up for a mastermind, a mentorship to actually be walked through the process because uh, at this point I was what, probably 36 years old and 37. And I was like, 
I don't have any more time to waste. I want to make sure I'm doing this with a pro who's done this before. So I signed up for that mentorship. Once I learned how, how um, apartment investing worked, the one thing that they could not teach me, and, I, and I, I've heard this in multiple uh, mentorships, is they couldn't teach me how to analyze a deal. <laughs> right? They just say, oh, yeah, underwrite it. I was like, cool. How do you do that? So they gave me a model. Uh, it was the Michael Blanc model, syndicated deal analyzer. I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with that one. And I was like, okay, how do I use this? And, and nobody really understood it to a, a very uh, intricate, in-depth level where they could explain it to me. So through trial and error, I beat myself over the head with that spreadsheet. I dived into every single cell and I tore apart that whole entire spreadsheet. And I've mastered it really, really well. And two things happened from there. Number one... I know that thing inside and out. So whenever I look at somebody else's underwriting, I can tell what's real and what's fudged. And then number two, I understood how to underwrite a deal and and basically give my investors a thumbs up or a thumbs down as to whether or not they should place their capital to that deal. So when I when I had all of those pieces, and by the way, this is probably towards the end of 2020, the beginning of 2021, I did my first LP investment into a 76 unit in St. Louis still paying my 10% uh, uh, preferred return on there. Uh, that one's pretty awesome. And then about eight months later, I did my first 42 unit general partner syndication. I raised all the capital on that one. I underwrote it. It was fantastic. As a matter of fact, we went full cycle on that one already. Wow. And in 18 months, um, 34% returns to the investors. And it was it, when I when we sold that property, we went full cycle. It really just solidified everything that I thought because up until that point, it was all conceptual, really. It was yeah. theory, right? But when these checks started hitting and when I got the, the proceeds from the sale, I was like, I just made my entire annual salary from one deal that I was mostly passive on. This is incredible. And then I just went nuts from there. I've done 19 separate syndications. I'm under contract on five more apartment contra- uh, apartment buildings right now. And I should be probably over 4,000 units by the end of the year. Um, wow. Um, that's a lot. Man, I, I, I love this so much. I, I want to start from uh, when you first started talking. Uh, Joel, if you're listening, good job, buddy. Uh, <laughs> at least you're, you're trying to help your, your friend out. Rasul, you went to Kansas City. Uh, you didn't last a year, uh, which I I love that because uh, you weren't your your heart really wasn't in it. Sounds like. Mm-hmm. Um, then you ended up going working for HUD, and you randomly got placed in multifamily, which was probably a blessing in disguise. Yeah. Um, you you were working with a customer that did a cash out refinance, uh, and that. That cash out refinance would have been about a 10 year uh, salary if if they were to pay you in a lump sum. Oh, yeah. But at that point, you, that planted a seed in your head and you're like, okay, there's got to be something else out there. Um, and then because you're passed on the promotion, had to train, uh, maybe not the replacement, but train the person that that took your job. Mm-hmm. Uh, you said, no, I'm, I'm good and, and went somewhere else. Um and that that boss's boss said, "Look, you're never going to be rich here, but you will be comfortable." And you're like, "Nope, um, I'm going to plan. I'm going to start my exit plan." I love that because that means you're thinking ahead, yeah. uh, and, and you're not uh, content with where you're at. Um, 2017, you Google <laughs> how to get rich, and you know Andrew Carnegie has that saying uh, back uh, over 100 years ago: uh, "90% of m- millionaires are." are uh, done so through uh, real estate or something like that. Obviously, yeah. I butchered that, but um, <laughs> you know, even though that's a hundred years old, that's still so true, right? Oh, yeah. So true, and and probably more true today than it was then, uh, yes. to be honest. Um, and then you said something to your your wife that I always say to my wife, and when I I say these three words, she knows like, oh boy, what's he doing now? And it's hear me out. <laughs> All right, babe, hear me out. That's that's how I say it. Um, it, but, but really what that means is I have a really good plan and just, just listen to me. It's not as far-fetched as you think. And yep. you got into uh, Airbnb, uh, did extremely well with that, but that was, um, you weren't working for your, your money, uh, you know, you were working for your money, right? Exactly. Your money wasn't working for you. Uh, even though there was some appreciation, you were working a lot to do that, uh, to do short-term rentals, um, 
uh, and so when uh, when COVID hit, you sold your your Airbnbs. Um, you know, probably got a lot of nice uh, nice equity built up and and some nice uh, checks there. But now you had to um, uh, kind of take a step back and reassess. Okay, what do we want to do long term? Right, because uh, you had done the corporate world. Uh, mm-hmm. No go. You, you did the government um, a couple times. Not going to do that anymore. You did real estate, but it was uh, very, very, very active in real estate, and you wanted some time back. So you felt like you were missing something. Um, a good buddy took you to a multifamily boot camp, and uh, a light, uh, the light at the end of the tunnel, you felt like was kind of reached at that point. Yeah, man, I I love that so much. Um, you you got in your first passive deal was I think seventy six units. I think you said in St. Louis. Mm-hmm. Eight months later, you uh, I think it was a 42 unit that you bought. You sold that. Um, and, and Rasul said uh, full cycle. That means they bought it and sold it. Uh, yep. they, they did their business plan. They sold it or cash out refi. But in this case, they sold it and had a nice return for uh, your investors. And you haven't looked back since uh, 19 syndications with five more under contract. Yes, sir. Man, that's uh, I need some water. <laughs> man, I've, been, I've been drinking the whole yeah. time <laughs> man i i love this story i i, I love that you know number one you, you came from very very humble beginnings right you started um don't know where you grew up but but in your words you um you know your friends and and most of your life what you knew back then it's still there the exact same way like a time capsule mm-hmm. really the only thing that's changed in all of that is you got out uh, you went to the military and, and the military opened your mind to, hey, there's a lot more possibilities than living, you know, here in Miami or, or what, wherever the suburb was. But and and from there, you were always just kind of curious, like, what else is out there? There's got to be something. But what is it? Just trying to find it. And it, man, you you definitely found it now. Yeah, um, absolutely. I think one of the biggest lessons for people who are who are listening, who are maybe wanting to strive and to get into more. I, I know a lot of the um, the, the basis of the, the podcast is for passive investors, but if you want to become a passive investor in multifamily syndications, hang out with syndicators, right? Because who you surround yourself with is likely to determine who you are going to become. And so when I left Miami, it freed me from the every single day life that these guys were living. And um, I, I just... I was terrified of looking back at my life, you know, being 70, 80 years old and thinking, man, I could have probably done something more than just live in this house that I grew up in, uh, that my parents left for me and everything like that. I love Miami. I've left three separate times. I've come back every, I I came (laughs) back every single time. But when I came back, uh, it was with a new perspective. And even, you know, truth be told, I don't even live in Miami where I grew up. I live in Broward County, just north of Miami. Like I can probably throw a rock and hit Miami if I really wanted to, right? Depends on how the shoulder's feeling today. But um, I I wanted to be in a place that, you know, cultivated good growth mentally, financially, physically, all of these types of things. I want to provide a great living. Because I I remember in nights going to sleep and it sounded like fireworks, but it wasn't the the new year and it wasn't the uh, 4th of July, right? And... Uh, even in college, when uh, I had to get a place with me and my brother, I used my GI Bill to pay for both of our education so that we can. That's why I have student debt. Right. Um, uh, I put him through college as well. And I remember one of the first I mean, the first week that we were staying there, you know, they're shooting in the parking lot. Mm-hmm. And I run to the room and I jump on them and I'm just like, oh, gosh, th- this can't be what life just has to be. Right. And when I got into life insurance. I'm grateful for that experience, not only for the sales experience of it, but that's the first time I ever like really talked to millionaires, mm-hmm. right? When I when I started realizing that there's people driving like Porsches and Lambos and Ferraris, like like these cars cost what people's houses cost, and they're just driving around not thinking anything about it. And so there's just certain things you can't unlearn, right? Like in in those seeds that are planted. So when my boss told me you'll never be rich, I was like. All right, then I guess I'll never be working here full time. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And as of this year, it became reality. I, I walked away and went full time real estate, um, digital entrepreneur since uh, March of this year. Man, that's that's amazing. Uh, and you said uh, who you surround yourself 
uh, with is who you will become. I love that so much. And I, I've heard it said other ways too, you know, the, the five people that you surround yourself with is, is who you'll become, but it, it, it's the same thing, right? Like oh, yeah. who you are around, who your, your network is, that is, is what you will become. Um, so think about that, make, make a decision. Like who, do, who do I want to hang out with? Right. Um, oh, yeah. and, and I'm sure for you, man, it, 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 it can be tough and, and probably was tough at first to kind of leave, uh, friends and, and people used to run around with, but now you, you look back and you're like, I, I can't believe that was me, you know? And I, I do that personally. I, I look back, I'm like, I, I can't believe I, I spent years, you know, going to bars and stuff like that yeah. uh, and, and thousands of dollars. Right. Yeah. It was, it was heartbreaking, honestly. Yeah. Um, just to talk about the perspective of making that shift, uh, interpersonally, um, I, I noticed a couple of things about the person that I was becoming was kind of not in alignment, or maybe it was the same way for them. Like when I read uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad the first time, I was like, oh, well, that's, you know, good for you. That's not me. Right. And so they might see me in that way. I, I never really had the conversation about it. But the one thing that revealed itself to me was when I moved to a nicer neighborhood and I got the bigger house and I was driving the, the fast cars and I, was, and I was building this life for myself my friends stopped coming around. I would stop getting invited to go to these other places. And, I, and to this day, people that I grew up with, like they call me brothers, you know, or family, stuff like that. They had never seen my kids. Mm, wow. And as an adult, I looked at it, you know, it was bittersweet because it was like, okay, I thought that these longtime friends were true friends and family to me. But the reality is, it was just a friendship out of convenience because I just happened to live next to him. Yeah. Right. And uh, I, I also, I struggled with a little bit going into it. I, I went to, I wouldn't call it depression, but it definitely made me stop and reflect and try to figure out, I need to come to terms with this because it's throwing me off my game. Um, I, I've got a pretty good reputation in the space for being like very jovial, great, easy to get along with, um, great networker, love talking to people, love adding value. I teach all the time. Um, but, you know, for those couple of months when stuff started hitting me, I was like, well, why, why do my friends not want to hang out with me anymore? Yeah. And I, I had to just make the determination that I'm, we're, our lives are just going in different directions. And uh, one way is not better than the other. I just know that for me, this is what I would prefer. And I, and I can't go back to the time capsule and be uh, and, and, you know, uh, have my life be dragged back in that direction because I'm very, I'm very cognizant about who and where I spend my time now. And I've got kids that depend on me. I got my wife, I want another kid. So I, I got all these visions and plans for the future that it might not be visible to them. And I just, I know what it takes to be able to get to, to these places and do these things. So um, I've made, uh, come to terms with all that stuff. It was, it's a really rocky emotional journey going through all the stuff. And I don't know if there's any book that, that walks you through how to deal with it, but, um, or how to deal with that. But, you know, I do the best that I can put on a smile, try to help out other people in the meantime and see where I can add value. Yeah, man. I, I love that. I can definitely resonate with that because, um, I, I feel like being an entrepreneur is very lonely journey. You know, you, you hear that a lot. Um, you kind of see that uh, I've seen that iceberg, right? Where the top of the iceberg, um, you know, only what is it, five or ten percent of the icebergs actually out of the water. And you mm -hmm. see that that flag on the top, and that's success. But then there's everything down below the surface that nobody sees. Yeah. How you struggle. That's one of the things that I struggled with as well. Is like I'm I'm not hanging out with those friends, uh, and maybe they're not friends, right? Maybe maybe it's just a, a convenience, like you mentioned, because we worked together or we lived around each other. Um, and, and so I, you've also said something uh, that I, I love. Uh, you mentioned that you you teach all the time. You like to mentor other people. Um, I want to kind of segue a little bit to um, I know you have an educational platform. Um, uh, what's the website of that? Yeah, so it's uh, rasulcre.com. Okay. Um, my website is mainly for investors or people who want to learn how to do the business of multifamily syndications. I've got uh, free information for passive investors as well. There's a guide to help you understand if you want to go put your money into a deal, these are some of the things that you want to consider before making that decision, right? And um, I'm also on all social media platforms, that's for Sewell CRE. CRE stands for commercial real estate for uh, people who aren't, um, who aren't familiar with the acronym. 
And yeah, very active on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. Uh, I shut down my 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 TikTok account. I got to start it over because I've had it for a really long time. It's just bad with the algorithm right now. But <laughs> for all intents and purposes, Rasul CRE, you can find me uh, even on YouTube as well. Um, I put some content out there. I'm always just trying to, to, to deliver information about how multifamily investing works, what it's done for me in my life, how it could change your life. And if you're a busy professional and you're like, I would love to get into real estate, I just don't have the time or the or the energy to devote to learning this other skill. That's the that's the beautiful part about being a passive investor is that you can stick to making your money with what you know how to do and then use that cash passively into a syndication with the right team. And you can look up our track record. My portfolio is on my website as well. You can look at disruptequity.com where I run acquisitions for and what our historic record is over there. I mean, we're, we're absolutely demolishing uh, the industry. I think um, in 2022, uh, yeah, just, just this past year, Inc. 5000 awarded us the fastest growing real estate company in Houston. Wow. So um, we're making pretty good waves there. And, you know, I, I met those guys at a networking trip in Costa Rica, which is some a statement I never thought I'd ever say. <laughs> um, but at, that's how we came to to know each other. And and they sat me down at a coffee shop and like, you know, we, we've seen what you've done. We like your hustle, your attitude, your demeanor. And we, we love to work something out where, you know, you bring you on board and help grow the company. And I'm like, I don't I don't work for paychecks anymore, but if there's equity in the deal, let's go. So <laughs> that's uh, that's what I do. I, I, I earn I, I work for commission on everything I do. I think I think for most people who are listening, if you if you get to the point where you learn how to make a living based on the results that you can provide versus being tied to an hourly wage you're going to see a massive shift in your lifestyle and what your earnings look like because the the golden handcuffs of a salary are are just that it's it's designed to to tie you down and i, I actually had this thought today when i was doing laundry i was like golden handcuffs yeah people are getting paid uh, X amount of dollars per hour, even if it's hundred dollars an hour. And if you get to over 40 hours of work in a week, they are willing to pay you time and a half, 50% more because you're getting paid so little on the front end anyway, even if it is 200 bucks an hour, 300 bucks an hour, if you're a surgeon or a high powered lawyer or whatever it is, it's not worth sacrificing that many hours to make that high dollar amount worth it. But you lose so much quality of life time away from your kids, your family, your wife, all that other stuff. You can't take vacations. I know so many miserable high dollar per hour employees. It's it's crazy. So yeah. um, to be able to identify that at the age that I did before I went down that path of trying to figure out how much can I make an hour, I was kind of like a little bit of a, of a savings for me. So you mentioned something earlier about um, if you could go back and tell your younger self, you know, whatever, whatever we were talking about, mm -hmm. do you think your younger self would have listened to yourself now? Like if you were to say, hey, I got all this wisdom for you, here you go. Do you think uh, younger Rasul would have been like, oh man, that's awesome. Or do you think it would have been like, whatever, I'm at the club? Uh, if, it, if I knew it was me, yeah, <laughs> I would have listened. Um, Cause again, I've, I've, I've seen, higher performing uh, individuals in various businesses. But at the time, it's interesting you say that because I'm, I'm thinking before me getting into sales, I probably wouldn't have believed as much because I was such a scared, shy kid. Yeah. Even after the army, I think I was, I, was a bit, I was a little bit better after the army because that definitely toughened me up and got me out of my comfort zone a little bit. Uh, more, maybe more jaded than anything. <laughs> um, but, but I wasn't as scared anymore. I was just, disappointed <laughs> yeah but um but yeah i'd like to think that if i had that conversation with my younger self i would have grabbed that information and just absolutely ran with it um but the the problem is and i want to know if it's a problem but i think just mentally like you said I, I don't think i would have been able been in a place to receive it i needed to go through the journey that i went through yeah. in order to have all these little you know bad habits or old habits or just old versions of me just being slowly stripped away because if I would have seen it all at once uh, it might have been too big 
it, it might just made me quit or give up. I'm like, you know what? That's I can't do. I can't do all that. But I got to learn how to sell. I got to learn how to talk to strangers. I got to be on stage. I'm. I got to deal with millions of dollars of people's <laughs> capital. I got. I got to do all that stuff. Um, that's a lot for a young twenty some year old kid to to try to imagine. And and I mean, it was hard for me to 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 think about owning my own car in the neighborhood I grew up with. <laughs> right. So yeah, I, I started off five twenty five at KFC. That was. That was that was work, honestly. Yeah. I mean, I still see some people at the Publix that I grew up at. Like Publix is the grocery store out here. Yep, we have um, it here. I know it's based in Florida. We love it here. In oh, Nashville. you have it in, in yeah. Tennessee? Wow. Yep. Okay, yeah. I need to go to Tennessee. Get, then. Getting big, getting big. But uh, yeah, man, you know, you you say um, possibly kind of depends where you were in life. I guess uh, if you would have listened, um, I, you know, I, I read uh, Rich Dad Poor Dad was in, um, referred to me or uh, recommended to me probably like in high school, late, late 2000s, early 2000, uh, or, uh, late 90s or early 2000s. And I think if I read it, then I would have been like, yeah, this is fiction, right? I mean, okay. That's a weird, like who, who writes this crap? (laughs) Uh, but then I read it on my second deployment and I was like, I was on fire, man. Told my wife to send me a bunch of books, took two months to get to me. Um, you know, read all those. I said, Hey, send me some more. And I, I think, you know, that, like you said, you went through your your process of old Rasul kind of getting stripped away layer by layer. I had to go through that too. I think a lot of people have to. Yeah. And I, you know, what's important is you you kept at it, right? You didn't stop and and you you had this mindset total change, but it didn't happen overnight. Like it won't happen overnight, but it does happen. Um, you know, and again, who you surround yourself with is who you will become. Um, man, I, I've had a great time talking to you. I know uh, we, we've hit on a lot. Um, just to reiterate, Rasul does have a, a free passive investors um, uh, content uh, for passive investors on his website. Uh, he also has some other educational stuff for uh, people that are have already uh, or that want to be active investors as well. So not just the passive um, investor information, but there's uh, some stuff on the website for people that want to be active investors. Um, We'll put all the all the links that you mentioned earlier in in the show notes. Uh, man, want to ask you about a book that you have recently read or um, listened to that really stands out to you? Uh, yeah, I think um, I think one of those books that really resonated with me. Um, there's one that I'm currently reading right now, which is absolutely transformational, especially. Uh, and this is more for like people wanting to make that entrepreneurial change. Uh, it's called Breaking the Habit of Being You. Uh, by Joe something, Dr. Joe, that's what I say. Um, I got to look up his name, but uh, it's an absolutely phenomenal book because for me, it gives a very kind of like scientific based explanation for the law of attraction, which a lot of people have seen the documentary, The, the Secret, or where you, you visualize something that you want in the future and everything like that. But this gives it like practical application and uh and it's explained in such a way that I've, I've never heard it before so that one's actually transformational for entrepreneurs now let's say for investors like passive investors uh the slight edge by jeff olson that one was a great book that i read that really talked about how to create uh monumental life-changing things by just doing the small daily habits every single day consistently over time and so um, the way that I explain it for, for passive investing mathematically, if you're, if you're able to invest into a syndication very regularly, maybe once or twice a year, you know, putting $25,000, $50,000 away each time, the level of returns from good syndications uh, with, a, with a solid team over time, when you're hitting, you know, 20, 30 percent returns and a disrupt equity, I think uh, historically we're at 50.6 percent average annual return, which is absolutely oh, insane. Yeah. Um, granted, a lot of that uh, comes into play with the fact that we sold in 2021 uh, right before the market started falling off. So we're buying back now with all these properties that are going into foreclosure and whatnot. But um, you're able to exponentially accelerate the growth of your portfolio compared to just putting money away into the S&P 500, doing some sort of managed portfolio with a a broker or brokerage or something like that. And it's just about being able to look at the math and the time required to be able to hit your target numbers. And um, 
yeah, I, I go through a little bit of this stuff in, in some of my guides, some of my trainings, and I make videos, uh, content out there. I I want to educate as many people as possible. I recently spoke at FIU as a guest lecturer at Florida International University, and because um, one of my students is actually a professor there, and she wanted me to talk to her students. She teaches real estate finance, oh, cool. and she wanted me to talk to the kids about being real estate entrepreneurs and things like that, which was a, a, a great experience. So um, I really want to start making the information available to people at a, an earlier age. Just start planting yeah. those seeds, right? Because yeah. I never even thought about it. And if somebody never told me about Rich Dad Poor Dad, I don't know if I ever would have bought any real estate. Yeah, love yeah. that. Um, all right, so those books, Breaking the Habit of Being You and then The Slight Edge. Um, very cool. And I, I I love that you are, uh, one of your students is a teacher and and yeah. you taught some of her uh, her students, super cool. Um, all right, Russell, what can people expect to see from you and in, in your business in the next few years? Um, more of the same, honestly. I'm going to continue doing syndications. I'm a big believer in housing, at least for the next 10 or 15 years, just because we have a housing crisis in this country. Yep. Um, inflation is a big problem. Uh, homes are becoming more and more unaffordable because wages do not go up nearly as fast as inflation does and and there's going to be this whole entire disappearing middle class so this is this is the thing that i saw coming back when i looked at uh me and my wife as a business as a financial analyst right i see it unfolding in real time and so i i'm i'm tying myself i'm hitching my wagon to multifamily because housing is just one of those you know top needs that people people will let their car get repossessed before they get kicked out of the street. Right. Right. Yeah. And so with housing being the biggest expense, learning how to master that craft. And, and honestly, uh, I'm trying not to get distracted by shiny object syndrome. There's a lot of things happening with artificial intelligence, right. cryptocurrencies, and it's like, it's tempting, but anytime I've deviated away from real estate, I lost money. So it's uh, my for me. It's like I'm gonna I'm gonna stick to what I know. I'm gonna become a master in multifamily, and maybe I'll, I'll hire a consultant for all that other stuff. But yeah. uh, as far as real estate goes and investing through uh, syndications, I'm gonna continue doing this. My plan is ten years, hit my target goal, and then um, sell out all my positions and go purely passive and no more active. And yeah, just hit my target six figures a month. That's it. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, all right. I, I know you mentioned several uh, social media platforms and, and your website. Uh, what's the best way for people to reach out to you? Best way for people to reach out to me, honestly, is through Instagram. Okay. Instagram or Facebook. I actually have a free Facebook group for uh, multifamily investors. It's called Multifamily Real Estate Investing with Rasool, R-A-S-O-O-L. Um, probably coming up on over a thousand people pretty soon in that platform. And I put out a lot of free content there. I go live in that group and I show actual underwriting processes or different aspects of multifamily investing. I do um, AMAs where you ask me anything, any kind of questions that are on your mind, fears that you have, concerns, doubts before you get started in the business. I went through all of it. I've got a pretty solid memory. And so I can I can put myself back into any point in my life and even draw up the emotion of what I was feeling. So I can I can sympathize with people who are like stuck in paralysis through analysis. Yeah, because this is something that's new. It's foreign. It's it's off the beaten path. It's not just let me go take my nine to five, put my match in my 401k, start an IRA and invest in the S&P 500. Like that, that cookie cutter advice will make you very comfortable, but you'll never get rich. Right. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. Okay. And then um, social media handles, we will put those in the show notes. Mm -hmm. uh, you, mean, you mentioned Instagram, Facebook. Um, earlier, you mentioned YouTube. Um, and then what was uh, what was the best website to reach you? www.rasoolcre.com. Okay, perfect. Man, it has been awesome talking to you. Um, we've spent almost probably an hour or so just... Uh, Talking about military, talking about mindset, talking about uh, our passion, real estate. Uh, man, your, your journey is incredible with uh, very humble beginnings to where you are now, almost half a billion dollars in equity. 
guarantee you never would have thought that in your wildest dreams growing up, probably even in the military. Um, but uh, man, love to see your growth and, uh, you know, over this time, it's it's been amazing. So thank you so much for being here. I encourage the audience to reach out to Rasul. Um, I hit him up on Facebook. He responded very quickly. Uh, then it took me another three weeks <laughs> to respond and he responded very quickly. So he's a lot better at responding than I am, but man, thank you so much for being here. Hey, thank you, Charlie. And I, I do want to make one point, one thing out. Yep. It's half a billion in assets under management. Um, that's the property value, not the equity. If it was the equity, I'd be disappeared in some island somewhere, just chilling on the beach. <laughs> hey, you know, most people have, uh, I don't know, let's call it $750,000 home. And that's what what their real estate is, right? So yeah. that, uh, you know, I don't know how many, uh, half a billion would be, it'd be, I don't know, half like billion, owning like 700 homes. Yeah, half half a billion with probably 20, anywhere between 20 to 40% down payment. So that much equity and that split 70% to the investors. So mathematically, I just think about these types of things. Um, and my ownership percentage ranges anywhere from half a point on my smallest ownership up to 35% yeah. on my largest uh, chunk of the deal. So it really just depends on on where I'm at. Yeah. Man, thank you so much for being here, Rasul. Um, Honor to talk to you and, and learn from you. Pleasure, Charlie, man. Thanks for having me on. And you guys, man, follow Charlie. He's uh, he's going to be an awesome trajectory growing this podcast. Uh, very honored to be one of the first uh, episodes here. So hopefully it gives you some traction. And uh, yeah, guys, if you have any questions whatsoever about passive investing, hit up Charlie, hit me up. I'd love to be able to have a conversation with you guys and explain to you exactly how all this business works so I can clear up any confusion you might have. Thank you for listening to today's show brought to you by H&K Investment Group, your home for passive investing. If you want to learn more about how you can invest with us, please check out our website at hkigllc.com. Don't forget to like this episode and subscribe to our podcast. Please leave us a review to let us know how we are doing. Feel free to connect with me directly on LinkedIn or Facebook. As always, I'm your host, Charlie Hardage. Catch you next time. Thank you.